Welcome everyone to Already Cancel. We review TV shows. The year is 2020, and the name of the show is Babylon 5. <laughs> Every time Tara does that, I have no idea what she's actually trying to achieve. <laughs> da, 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 da. Is that close? I think it's close. No, 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 the melody I got there at the end was, I mean, it's, it's not great, but like I got what it was doing. <laughs> I got the gist of it. It's not an easy song to sing, okay. I mean, I, I would give it a go right now, but I feel like I'm a little worried if someone will catch this as the first ever review of Babylon 5 from us, and they'll be like, wait, is this just going to be 10 minutes of them singing? Well, there's a, there's a reason they would start with this review. That is true. it's the most important episode. Yes, of so probably the series. For for the record, uh, I'm Peter, and that is Tara. Just in case that was not mentioned before, I don't think it was. Uh, so, this is episode thirteen of season one. It's called Signs and Portents. So, full spoilers for the episode, as always. And th this is actually what the season is called. If you if you look at the DVD box sets, typically the seasons have titles, which is a bit unique. But Babylon Five has that, and the season one title is Signs and Portents. So, it takes its name from this episode, kind of maybe indicating the importance of this particular episode. And there's a lot of big stuff in this. There's a lot of stuff that advances uh, show mythology, character uh, dynamics and like relationships, and some stuff that's sort of there in small ways that's, that's you know, bubbling in the background from earlier plots, uh, core like relationships between the, the, the various races, the various ambassadors are all coming out of play here. And plus some hints at some of the big, more cosmic mythology stuff that, that's being teased, and uh, we're going to dive into all of it. Uh, but I suppose I'll just start with, what did you think of the episode? 10 out of 10. Take Garrett Graham <laughs> out of the equation. What did you think of the episode? I can't. He's the greatest actor of all time. <laughs> I So, yeah, Garrett Graham uh, is a guest star in this. He plays a... a a Centauri lord who comes to retrieve the eye, this this uh, artifact, this, you know, royal bit of jewellery, <laughs> essentially, that Londo this is... This is no bit of jewellery. Well, yes. Uh, <laughs> yes, Londo uh, disagrees with that description, but that's basically what it is. And this is something that the Centauri Empire, the Republic, has paid a great deal. We'll get into some of the, the minutiae of that in a minute, I think, but... Uh, to to retrieve from like a, a third party who like finds things, and Londo gets it at the station. This lord arrives with his aunt, who is like a prophet. Uh, they have that here in, on in Centauri She's a culture. Seer, yeah, a seer, yeah. She sees things in the future. Um, so he he's here, and this is an actor. Garrett Graham plays this guy, uh, who for some weird reason Tara has developed a bit of a fascination with over the past like few months. <laughs> I mean, it's it's our own fault, right? Because we watch B movies, and that's he's, true. He starred in so many of them. Not you, not a leading role, usually, but no, no, no. He's always he's always a a scene stealer, though, a lifelong scene stealer. Never really got his big chance. It go it goes all the way back to uh, Demon Seed, which we did on the Ace or Science mm -hmm. Fiction Movie Podcast. Uh, that was January. No, 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 no. But we recorded in January. Uh, yeah. It was April, I think, was actually 70s month where that went out. And then, yeah, we've done a bunch of recent movies on Ace, either bonus episodes or otherwise. Of just well, we didn't really star. notice them so much in Demon Seed, but we watched uh, The Philadelphia Experiment 2, which was a bonus episode where he was the main villain in it, and he mm -hmm. was just the reason to watch the movie. He was so good. Oh, it was the best part, for sure. And then he just keeps popping up in things. So, popped up in Beware the Blob. Mm -hmm. And then we started to look for his movies because he's great. Uh, Tara says we. Uh, Tara <laughs> started to look for his movies. Um, and yeah. at least on one occasion, roped me into watching a random movie on Tubi with her one night. Uh, <laughs> the Annihilators, highly yes. recommend to anybody. <laughs> I don't, I don't, if you like Mystery Science Theater 3000 level of movie, then yes. Oh, it's it's better than that. It's a lot more watchable. Though if they made a riff tracks of it, it would be great. Yes, I, I think... There's room in that movie for the Rift Tracks. So, he shows up, 
Uh, and, you know, the plot obviously uh, ends up being him. He's actually got a plan to betray and, like, sort of pretend to be kidnapped by these raiders. And that was the other thing, is that the raider plot, because we've had mentions of raiders a few episodes here or there mm-hmm. since the start of the show. And this kind of, like, brought that into kind of, like, a through line where, oh, this was all maybe a part of this and now it's over uh, after mm-hmm. this episode. So, um, but the, the big thing, I think, I think the, the main element we have to start with, that we'll, and we can spiral all the other conversation out of that, is the mysterious man who's on the station, uh, who's always smiling. He's a bit, bit weird, but... Uh, what do you want? Untrustworthy, <laughs> yes. And his plot in the episode is basically to go around the main ambassadors and ask them, uh, that's this Mr. Morden, uh, ask them what they want. That's all he does. He goes to Jakar first and he says, what do you want? And I think the reactions of the, the various alien ambassadors uh, says a lot and in some cases it just kind of reinforces stuff we already knew to an extent i think you know jacquar again treats it as silly but then ultimately kind of opens up thinking it's pish posh doesn't really think much of it but just kind of opens up and goes on well we get the scene with him with him and jacquar right after jacquar and londo had a fight outside of an elevator a glorious fight might i add (laughs) Uh, there's, there's a pure, there's a pure so, extra. Yeah, there's, there's, there's a, a lot of like you know, everyone's a bit high strung. Yeah, there's a, there's a pure, <laughs> there's a pure extra. There's, a, there's this uh, human. Well, I think he was a human anyway. It looks human enough. Uh, I think he's and, human. Yeah. In between the two of them, so basically, Londo's just received. It's kind the of an eye. allegory for, for the ambassadors of, of, Babylon Five, right? Like the the two races are fighting, and it's only the humans in between. But the humans are oh. so puny in between these towering aliens. Yeah, I guess. But it's, it's just it's just after Londo's received the eye and he's been all excited about it and he, he treats it with this, this, you know, this is an artifact from the first ever emperor, right? So again, mm-hmm. even even the plot of the, the, the eye itself is tying into what the theme of the Centauri and what Londo's view of the Centauri are, which mm-hmm. is the idea of nostalgia for the glory days, the good yeah. old days. He even uses that phrase later on, he calls it the good old days. Yeah. Um, he says, this is no longer the good old days. Yes. But he he's waiting for the elevator, and Jakar comes up. And they're being civil at first. He's like, ambassador. Ambassador. <laughs> and then Jakar presses the button. He's like, I already, I already pushed, pushed it. it. <laughs> well, I pushed it again. Ah, yes. And it's just, so, so even though I heard there all- was a famine. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, well, if you guys didn't take our resources. Well, actually. Oh, it's our fault. <laughs> I, that's how it goes. I do want to point out, though, it's, it doesn't say, I, uh, when he says there's a famine, he doesn't say, oh, so bad. My condolences. Yeah, it's the way he says, my condolences. It's just, it's the way he says it. It's just, it's beautiful. It's a beautiful yeah. line delivery. There's a lot of passive aggressiveness there. Yes. So they end, up, they end up missing the elevator, and the, the poor little human, he just, like, dives in and presses the button, and the elevator leaves, and they just, like, look at what it made me do. And they say it in unison to each other. Uh, it's glorious. But yeah, so, so Morden goes to him, and Shikari ends up going on a tirade of, like, oh, I, you know, it basically boils into what we've said about him before, and the, the, the Narn before, which is the revenge of his yeah. people. Uh, on, Against the Centauri, yes. and that's it. For, for what Because he asked him, like, well, well, then what? What would you do after, if once you got your revenge he's like i don't really care that's all that matters yeah there's no there's no looking past that because yeah, we've yeah. talked about this before how the narn seem obsessed with the idea of revenge for the past the centauri seem obsessed with going back to a better time where they were in more power and mm-hmm. that kind of comes up because it's notable that londo's last londo's last out of all the ambassadors we get to see him go speak to because next up is delen and delen we don't get to hear what she wants but we do see her kind of freak out and her little, her symbol in her head that comes out that sort of shows she's part of the Grey Council. You know, Satai, Delenn, that all that. Is that what that is? Yeah, I think that's what it is. But Because she hides it because it comes out on her forehead and she, she sort of like, you know, covers her head and she's like, you know, leave, yeah. leave here now. I have the same problem if I drink alcohol, like I just get all <laughs> red. It just kind of comes out. <laughs> but I think her reaction, her sensing that this is someone who should not be trusted, that this is someone dangerous... Uh, despite, of course, the the well, cheery. Well, I mean, the uh, the the prophet lady, the aunt, said that Gary Graham's character would be killed by a shadow, and everybody kind of laughs it off. And then when she looks at him after her symbol pops up, he hmm. kind of turns into a shadow, and that happens yeah. like right after that. 
I, yeah, not, not literally. It's more just that the light goes out. And that the light goes out. He looks like a silhouette yeah. of a shadow. Yeah. Yes. Uh, no, I, I mean, that moment, like, again, gives you a sense that she's... A, a, she, she obviously the the Mimbari aren't as advanced as where uh, like the you know the the Vorlons are right. They're not at that mm-hmm. level of being in the next stage of evolution where they're looking down at humans saying you're not ready for this, you're not ready for that, blah blah. Right? We've had examples of that with with Kosh before, but clearly she is at a stage where she is a bit more wise, and I think her reaction to to this Morden really does kind of stick out mm-hmm. is be hard like sort of recognizing there's danger here where the others have kind of just like you know like they, they, they don't get the sense of danger they don't, they don't even understand the point of them they're just kind of like laughing off his request with the exception of course of kosh who when kosh arrived because and this is the thing i recognized his ship was a Vorlon ship because we were talking mm-hmm. recently about like uh, a flower yeah starting to recognize the ships is that you see it coming into dock and i'm like oh that's a Vorlon ship and then sure enough it was like oh you know ambassador kosh welcome back like, ah see that's right um but notably Morden, when he sees Kosh walking about, he Turns tries around. to hide. Yeah, he hides around the corner. He doesn't he doesn't want anything to do with him. He knows not to interact with him. Mm-hmm. And it's later on where Kosh actually tracks him down, finding out you know, somehow that he's on the ship and says, Leave here now. You know, they, they are, are not, not for you. They are not for you. Which led me to some thought about who he is or not who he is but who he represents because i don't know if Morden himself is the big bad i think he maybe just represents the big bad as maybe the more lately of the options but of course the the shadow the the big ship the that we saw before and then we see again at the end of this episode this big mysterious you know whoever this alien life are who have this big spiky ship right uh that appears out of nowhere I got to thinking, you know, when Kosh says they're not for you, it made me think that, okay, so Kosh has made some decisions where he said, okay, you're not ready for immortality, or you're not ready for that, or blah, 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 or I'm, I'm researching your your past earth, or blah, blah, blah. Like, the Vorlons are clearly at this next stage, and they're sort of looking down in the rest of the, the races and saying, you're not really at this stage of evolution yet, you're not ready for this knowledge. But ultimately, you get the sense that maybe the reason why he's making these choices and why the Vorlon are making these choices are not necessarily mean or vindictive. They're arguably out of our own best interest, where he, th- you know, they're making these choices based on what they think is best for our development. And this is a bad idea for you to jump into this. You're not ready for these tools that you're going to abuse. You're not, you're just going to ruin everything. Like human beings will ruin everything if they have immortality at this stage in their existence. Right? And it's very believable, I think. It made me think that whoever this enemy is, whoever Morden represents, are equally, you know, on the same level or similar level to the Vorlons, but there are more evil, sinister, li- like, you know, people who will manipulate us and who will try yeah, to... Yeah, well, they I, they definitely seem to be playing with, um, like, whatever species is lower than them. Yeah, well... Uh, I, I, for, for what reason, I don't know. Obviously, we don't really know yeah. anything other than... They do choose but they pick. Londo. Yeah, well, because that's the that's the thing is they go to Londo last, or sorry, Morden goes to Londo last, and you know Londo, similar to Jacquard, trying to like get away from him at first, eventually turns around just goes on like a, a rant about, oh, I mm-hmm. want this entire to be back to the glory days of the empire and this and that, um, and I think it's. Not- I think this. I think this is a really good scene because when he was with um, Lord Kiro, I think that's his name, Lord yes. Kiro. Yes. Yeah. Um, he, and Kira says when he gets the artifact, like, remember what it was like, like with this, there's a chance that we can bring back the glory days, our empire, our emperors, uh, you know, no one's seen him in like a year. The prime minister is an, is a joke. Like, uh, uh, but I, I this think, could yeah. restore. Yeah. I think they said, cause uh, yeah, just as we get into this now, like he mentioned that the prime minister is leading like a council, but it's kind of like no one's got faith in them because there's no emperor to back them up. So, yeah. so, so I, think, I think what's interesting about that is that we keep getting these seeds and tidbits about what uh, the politics are like on Earth. I think it's interesting that we're now getting that for one of the other races. We're getting that for Centauri. Uh, so, yes, that's your point. Yes. So <laughs> I just think it's a very interesting scene because he, like Graham's character is saying like look we have an opportunity to bring back the glory days and londo is the one who talks him down and says look if you try to go in there guns blazing with this artifact 
saying that you want to restore your noble house to being the emperor again. Um, you have no one to back you. Like you'll, you won't last like a day. He talks him down from it. And he, he says, this is no longer the good old days. You have to get over it. Yeah, that's. And, I think that's the key point there, is that when Londo's talking right, down which from is this, what he, I'm about, about to say, if you let me finish. So, sorry. Okay, go on. <laughs> so, and then when you get the scene where um, the mysterious figure is asking Londo what he wants, he does want those things. He had to suppress those feelings when he was talking to somebody else who was trying to say, like, we could restore the empire. empire. And, and when Londo gets his opportunity... He does have all those thoughts and he just has to like control them all the time. Yeah, it's not even just that he's controlling them, it's that he understands that things have changed and what he actually wants is that he wants those things to have not changed. He wants it to be, because essentially what right. they're talking about is that there was a time where if one of the families walked in and tried to take control, it may actually work and it would be respected if you have a show of strength, you have a show of power. Now it's a bit more diplomatic and everyone bickers and it's, it's just mm -hmm. more of a tangled web of politics than it used to be. Um, and it's basically so when he says the good old days like he does genuinely mean he wishes it was like the old days where they could go in and take this power back one of the key points i think we should you sort of alluded to it but i think we should make clear is that kiro's family is literally the, the descendants of the, the original emperor the original mm -hmm. you know like, so that's why he, he should believes, be next in line yeah, for emperor like that, he should be the one leading if they just had those old days back yeah that, that's why he believes he's entitled to take this and become because because all he's tasked with here from the from the, the empire is to take it back and the reason why the empire want it is that they think that this will restore faith in the uh the political like assembly whatever the group mm -hmm. is that's running things right now that this will ensure that the right. public will see them as strong and it'll be like a show of strength and like hey look we have this we are we've never been stronger have your faith in us and I love the idea that, because obviously it's easy for us to focus on the Earth politics because A, it's a, a lot easier to relate them to the real world because they are very similar. Um, mm -hmm. And there's obvious allegories, you know, you just take out, you know, immigration from other countries and just replace it with alien immigration and okay, boom, we've done it. That's it. It's just already telling the same story yeah. uh, with that one key detail difference. Uh, here, I do love the idea that we're getting the sense of these other places. And I, I'm sure, I'm not a history buff, I'm sure people who are history buffs can probably look at the, you know, the, the Nar and the Centauri and basically give you examples of what they, you know, what they're taking from in history. Like, okay, the Centauri take this from this, you know, country or this regime or this, you know, piece of history. I can see, I'm, I'm sure there's some history buffs who'll tell us, ah, oh, you know, this, this whole idea of the Centauri Republic, this is based on this group of people. Um, mm. I, I can't do that, I don't know. But I'm assuming that they all are, because... GMS, the Narnar, the Ottoman Empire. <laughs> because JMS, uh, who runs the show, like he seems like a smart dude who put a lot of thought into all this stuff, and I feel like he's probably taking from history with some of this. Yeah. So, I mean, I, when I, what I got from the scene, like when the mysterious person, if he is a person, um, goes and says, okay, like I've basically chosen to side with the Centauri because mm -hmm. of what Londo has said, and he's giving him an, uh, giving him you know what he needs to to start hey, and, we, should, uh, we should we should talk about what we think that was like why he picked londo right so yeah. i think i think it's interesting if this show is giving us like the most easily liked character and it's going to mm. turn him into a villain like that's a really cool thing if they do if they go that route yeah, yeah at least uh, for this whole season arc i don't know it, it could be you know, possibly an outright villain. It could be the sort of thing where at some point he actually has a good turn where he realizes what they're making him do or realizes what they've done to him or realizing mm -hmm. the web that he's now in because now he owes this higher power that he doesn't understand. Because right, obviously... If he turns into somebody that we have to root against or that Sinclair or the station or Earth has is all of a sudden, you know, our big baddie of the season or of the series ends up being Londo. That's a really, you know smart decision i think because he's obviously the most likable character on the show there's there's power in that there's absolute power mm -hmm. in that I, I can also see it be a thing where it does that for to a point and then at some point we're past that and he has to kind of accept what he's done and maybe realizes what he's done or well, something yeah i mean we we would definitely want a redemption story if yeah. they do that because we obviously we love londo <laughs> of course yeah no, no doubt um because i i think 
at least what stuck out to me and and these the, the way compared to because it's really just him and Jakar, right? All even though he goes to see the land, uh, Kosh goes to see him. It's really between the two ones that are always at conflict. It's not the ones that are always button heads, and that is the Narn and the Centauri. And I think compared to Jakar, Jakar basically, as you said earlier, he has no plans beyond getting revenge. There's nothing after that. Mm-hmm. Um, and even the way Jakar talked earlier on about when Londo accuses of him, oh, well, the famine's happening because you're using all your supplies to build up your military. You're not actually mm-hmm. taking care of your planet. Um, you get a sense that that's almost the pre- prevailing thing in the Narn culture is that they're, that's what they're doing as a, as a, on a whole, is that they're so obsessed with the idea of strength and making sure that they can get revenge and not be taken advantage of again, that everything else is kind of secondary and that's why conditions might be... Maybe, maybe they still be you know, not perfect, but they definitely could be handling other parts of the world better than they yeah, are. It's too much military spending. Whereas Londo's whole rant, like when he talks about restoring the empire and talks about wanting to feel powerful and not feeling like he's beholden to things. He talks about how he doesn't want to walk around feeling like he's always late for something or walking around like he feels like he owes something to someone. He wants he to wants, be boss. He wants to be boss and he wants them to sort of reign. So it's like, I felt like Londo's, at least at face value from hearing it, it sounds like Jakar's has got an end point and there's nothing after it, whereas Londo's, it sounds like, no, once he has it, he wants to keep that. He wants yeah, that he, to be he, everlasting. The Narn want, want revenge, but the Centauri want power. They want to be on top. Yeah. That's much more easy to manipulate, I think. Yeah, um, and I think that's why he... Because, you know, the actual plot of the episode, you know, beyond all these modern things, is that there's a mysterious group of raiders who they don't really know like they, they can't catch them uh but ultimately their end game is that they're, they're trying to create a diversion ivanova goes out with a squad out into into space the episode actually opens with ivanova uh, there's like a mm-hmm. little joke scene at the, the start where she wakes up and uh like she's mad at her, her fancy alarm clock and she says to sinclair uh sleeping's fine but waking up's a problem i've always had a problem waking up when it's dark outside and sinclair's like we're in space it's always dark outside she's like I know. <laughs> we know she grows coffee also. Yes. <laughs> Illegally. Which does actually line up with the idea that she has tr- trouble waking up. These these are things mm-hmm. that actually marry together quite well. <laughs> mm-hmm. And they're both just, they're essentially just little jokes that sort of explain that her job's really tough and she's not constantly doing things. <laughs> but, you know, uh, it works. Um, but uh, it's all a diversion. Uh, well, so they can seemingly steal the eye it turns out that Lord Kiro's actually orchestrated this and he's working with them. It, that never gets revealed in front of anyone, though. Uh, no. We see that after the fact because the uh, Adira, the, 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 the prophet ant, uh, essentially sees the vision of what happens after they've left because the main raider ship can jump on its own because it's this big, expensive ship, so it can create its own jump gate, essentially. And all the little raiders go towards that and like sort of hook onto it, and that's why they're sort of disappearing so quick. Uh, you know, I'm glossing over that a little bit, but I actually do really like how there's a nice, like, mechanic in there to ex- like because they really set up how they're getting away so quickly they have, it's you know it's so far to the yeah. next jump point it doesn't make a lot of sense so this establishes no a big enough ship on its own can actually have its own jump drive and right. you know so it's establishing some key things for later maybe that's so maybe important does that mean it can jump to whatever it wants or does it jump to like another jump gate i think it can jump wherever it wants i think it can just okay. make its own jumps yeah um i think the little ships need the gates that's that's you know they go through a gate and they head up, end up whatever the other gate is. <laughs> However that works. Um, whereas the, this ship can just make its own. So, mm. um, But we see that they turn their back on Kiro. And they aren't going to kill him. They're going to send them back home and just basically blackmail him. Like, hey. Yeah, you're going to go back. We're not going to help you overthrow your government because mm-hmm. we know it won't work. It's not going to work with a band of pirates again <laughs> behind you. Yep. Like, so... Instead, we're going to send you and blackmail you, uh, send you back, blackmail you, so you keep giving us money. And, and we're going to ransom off this eye because we can buy a couple more of these big ships with this. Uh, yep, and that's when the mysterious big spiky ship appears out of nowhere, the shadow ship, if you will, mm-hmm. and blows it to smithereens. And yep. Adira sees this and drops the uh, the, the cup of coffee and it smashes. Mm-hmm. It's very, very <laughs> dramatic, overly dramatic. Uh in the traditional sense but you know it works and basically Sinclair wants to like hear about what this eye is why they didn't know about it uh, this all happens off camera 
Uh, we'll go back and talk about the other things, but uh, the end of the episode is very, you know, and it really feels like it's like this was the prologue to the show. This, like, story yeah, so, so far. Is this the end of the Raiders? Was that, like, the Raider mothership and now they're gone? Or is that just a, like, branch of Raiders? I got the impression this has been the Raiders so far. It doesn't necessarily mean there won't be any other Raiders, but... Yeah. Okay. I, I got the impression that oh, the, the Raiders we've seen up until this point might be connected to this. And this is, this is you know, well, maybe I'm just, maybe that's just wishful thinking. Maybe all the Raiders we've seen so far have all been different Raiders and this is disconnected. But given, given the show seems to be very good so far with like making little things like connect and tie together and whatnot, mm-hmm. I'll, I'll give it that benefit, I think. Uh, but the end of the episode, you know, when, when Adira tells Sinclair of this vision, uh, he's like, yeah, yeah, I, I was told, but you know, we we you know we staved off the attack, the big fight with the raiders, we won, you know, the ships, you know, the station has been saved, and uh, you know, everything's fine. He's like, no, no, it's still a possible future. That this thing that I saw wasn't something that was happening today. It was something that's going to happen some time from now, and shows him the vision, and the main theme plays as she says, it's a possible future. You can try and you know stop it. You can save the station. And what's funny is that. This core idea at the end of the episode, which is basically the station might, like, end and die and everything will be for nothing, or mm-hmm. you might be able to save it. It's not really new information. I mean, ultimately, that's the plot of any show, is that all this might go bad, <laughs> or it might not. Plus, it's but, been the fate of every Babylon station before 5. Yeah, so there's nothing new about this, but it still kind of feels like it's, it just kind of punctuates the episode quite well of saying if mm-hmm. if this episode's about setting up the biggest themes and the biggest ideas that we're going to be carrying forward for the show then this at the end does kind of feel like oh hey this is like this felt like it was like uh your opening prologue just ended this was the the, the setup for the rest not, i mean i'm not saying that the rest of the season isn't also still prologue stuff necessarily but um this episode definitely felt like it was the most important one so far and mm-hmm. that's not to say that it's standalone because it everything no. that feeds off of everything that we've had so far yeah it absolutely does so um on the show you know this show is guilty of having the sound in space as many other sci-fi shows are so i won't complain too much about it but one that did bother me is that when they say shut the blast doors because they're getting into combat uh they're inside the the, the bridge and you can still hear the, the blast doors shutting from the outside and i'm like okay like that that, that was too much <laughs> right maybe it's just the mechanical sounds from the inside that you're hearing mm, i don't know that's so like that. i like that they had that, oh, that makes there's sense. like a bunch of little mechanical things i noticed in this one the like turrets. there's the there's the well yeah the turrets but mm. like the that they have a blast shield i don't think i ever noticed that before i just assumed it would be like star trek magic shields <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's just like an, a physical barrier that comes down over the windows and they have to rely on their like sensors and stuff in order to see what's out there i, I like and the- then there's also the like at one point sinclair is like recalibrate the turrets so that they can mm. do longer range or something and the guy's like that's gonna take a minute because we have to take them all down like that's cool that they acknowledge that it's not just a uh sure recalibrating done <laughs> it's like no this takes time we have to yeah like shut everything down and, and redo it by hand so i liked uh during all this it's not even related to what's going on i think, I think it's just londo grabbing adira he's like finding her after the because you know there's a little standoff where they get separated and you know lord kiro's taking on the ship at gunpoint but uh, londo's just grabbing her in the chaos but it's in the main sort of like you know the, the main shopping area of the station and mm-hmm. Like there's like a, you know, there's the flashing lights are on. There's like a, there's like a siren. Say, you're basically telling everyone to go go to their quarters and like you know brace because we're going to combat. And I'm like, I, I don't know if I've seen this before, but it definitely made it feel like oh this is a big deal that all mm-hmm. all the all the fighter pilots are launching because there's something happening right outside the station. They're in danger. It, everyone it, goes into a lockdown or general yeah. quarters. It felt it felt big. It felt like a a big moment uh, during during the fight um obviously they're smart enough to realize it's a diversion so ivanova's team come back so that garibaldi's team's not completely screwed um and she gives the Arnold schwarzenegger line knock knock no she's a surprise (laughs) (laughs) i was hoping it would be knock knock (laughs) that would have been good i i I don't don't deny that would have been glorious um now i i think uh and obviously morden shows up uh because we think the eye's been lost because it was in the explosion when the ship got destroyed you know by the, yeah. the shadow ship but morden shows up when at Gary london's Graham door got destroyed he did uh but london uh, gets this eye from morden and morden's batmaned out the scene 
because he turns around because mm-hmm. he's, he's he's annoyed that he has to see someone else he's like oh what's one more annoyance but then when he sees the eye he's delighted because when he's talking to Adira, he thinks he's going to get fired. He thinks that his mm-hmm. his role as ambassador is over because he lost the eye, even though I mean, there was a siege and it wasn't really his fault. But like, if he was they responsible, played, they apparently paid the price of a small planet. Yeah, but when he sees the eye, he's so delighted and he rushes. Says, "Oh, let me buy you a drink. Let me buy you a fleet of drinks. Like, how do I find you?" And you just hear Morden's voice say, "We'll find you." Mm-hmm. Um, From the shadows. And he's just he's so <laughs> delighted. He's so delighted, um, but yeah, th- this is th- this is Morden and whoever he represents have have made their choice. This is who they're going to use as a tool. The the Mimbari, sorry, the Centauri, <laughs> slip there. The Centauri are who they're going to use based on their ambitions, based on what they want to manipulate. Um, and, and how many you know things in the real world does like, one group get manipulated or like? eaten up by a larger political group because they serve a purpose to them because it'll be a mm. beneficial relationship it just i mean we don't even know what the details are yet i'm sure it'll become more clear as we watch more but uh you can already see kind of what they're going to be poking at here yeah we some sort of proxy war <laughs> um so that stuff was uh was good honestly in, in kosh like scaring morden into hiding also really interesting i'm excited to see the the Volon yeah, relationship. I was getting some uh, some Q continuum vibes from Morden and Kosh. Uh, like a little Q versus Guinan <laughs> from Star Trek. I, I, I could, you know what? That's not a bad comparison. Uh, yeah. Shrouded in a bit more mystery than that, but yeah, definitely, I can see the comparison there. Yeah, like I don't. I mean, I, I don't know who these, who he represents, what the shadow, big, spidery looking ship is. Um, I mean Q. Q in the Star Trek universe is a like all powerful being that is all no it's basically God <laughs> or some God, um, but and these guys don't seem to have like unlimited power, but we'll see exactly what they are. I'm I'm I mean I got like vibes of it, but not exactly like no, these guys they, are capable of anything no they certainly have more power there's certainly higher life forms in the sense that they've advanced a bit more but mm-hmm. uh yeah but cl- clearly that they're both older they're both wiser and I-, I definitely got the impression that morden and whoever he represents are maybe the evil versions in some way of whatever the vorlons are uh mm-hmm. so i'll be very curious to see when they pop back up because i don't think it'll be too soon i think it'll, i think these appearances from these characters are going to be spread out a little bit uh but definitely, I think that ship blowing up the the raider ship and and then the eye suddenly being with Morden and coming to Londo proves a connection between Londo and that ship, right? Mm-hmm. Or not Londo, sorry, uh, Morden. It proves a connection between Morden yeah. and that ship, okay. and the, he whoever he's working for are related to that ship. So uh, that that that's a tangible connection there. As far as other stuff in the episode to talk about, uh, Sinclair brings Garibaldi into his Mimbari mystery. Oh, that, I don't even mean that alliteration, but Mimbari mystery. Uh, I like it. Where, obviously mostly off camera because we already know all this, but he explains to Garibaldi uh, what he's went through, what he's kind of vaguely remembering, how Delenn's involved. And so Garibaldi's on the case. The one key thing that comes of this this episode is that Garibaldi finds out that Sinclair wasn't the first choice for Babylon 5 to run the place. It wasn't even the second yeah. or third. He was like way down the list. But... The Mimbari basically had final, say. had final say in who was going to run the place, and they turned down everyone until they got to Sinclair. Sinclair was the one they wanted. Uh, so that's all it is. It's just that one detail, and they're, they're obviously he's confused by it. He's like, wait, why? But why? Good, good question. <laughs> why? <laughs> <laughs> that was actually not a bad impression. <laughs> you know, I've done a few Sinclair impressions, and each time I do, I'm like, that's pretty good. <laughs> that wasn't bad. I'll, I'll give you it. I'll give you it. I'm only working my Londo a little bit because I think uh, I like my Londo. Um, oh, uh, by the way, it was pointed out in the comments because uh, obviously we tend to be too ahead in these uh, versus what the public one or give, give or yeah. take because we all obviously they go up on Patreon first so by the time they go public they're you know almost two it's weeks old. A couple of weeks, yeah. Um, but uh, the episode with Garibaldi and his like, you know, his backstory from a couple of weeks ago uh, some of the comments let us know that the actor who plays Garibaldi was an alcoholic in real life. And I don't remember what we said that 
they felt the need to tell us that, but I'm assuming we say that maybe the joke or did something to in to inspire the need to tell us that he was an alcoholic in real life and that we obviously didn't know. So you're heard. I don't know what we said, but you're heard. Like, <laughs> oh, I think I just I think I said something. I think I noticed like the way he drank in the show was oh, like okay. a drinker. I don't okay. think that's well, offensive. <laughs> well, <laughs> or, no, I don't think that's like distasteful or anything. I think it well, just it came through. I wasn't necessarily saying that it was. I just didn't know what prompted it. So it may have been mm. something. Or, I mean, I don't know. We may have cracked some sort of innocent joke that <laughs> had we known he was a real alcoholic, it might have been a bit slightly poor taste. Mm. <laughs> but, no, I didn't know. Um, I mean, I sort of inferred, I guess, but I didn't know for sure. Uh, no. Um, but yeah, but I, I think had you known, you probably wouldn't have said that. Not because it's offensive in and of itself, but just because it'd be a weird thing to say when you know he's an alcoholic. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. Because like, why, why would you need to say it? Because like, you, at the very least you would say it in a different way because you'd be saying, oh, hey, you can see that he's had experience here or something. I don't know. <laughs> but I thought it was worth mentioning because a few people pointed out. Really? Um So, yeah, that's that. Um, it's unfortunate. It, yeah, it's a shame. It's a shame. And it, uh, apparently it was a factor in his death as well because, you know, he died young, uh, like like a few of the actors, which is a shame. Mm-hmm. Um, no. no, I mean, uh, I, I really like this episode. I mean, I, I, obviously you said you loved it, 10 out of 10, because of Gary Graham, but taking that out of the equation, like, in all seriousness, how did you feel about the episode in terms of I what it actually did? I think it's a great did? episode. It's yeah. probably the best one so far. No, I agree. Uh, I, again, it's not in a vacuum. There's so much backstory or, like, relationships between, you know, Jakar, Londo, whoever... Um, Sinclair juggling things, whatever it is, but all, all of these things, it all feels like this, this incorporates all of it. The fact that it incorporates some of the Mimbari Sinclair plot, the main plot, brings back in the mystery of these big aliens that, we you know, are mysterious and we don't know who they are, uh, but ties it into the Londo Jakar plot, and then, you know, the Kosh mm-hmm. mysteries kind of tied into that. It feels like everything was kind of, I mean, not everything, everything, like there's no Talia this episode, there was no Franklin, so there's definitely- We haven't seen Talia in a while. She does disappear for, like, episodes at a time. I'm sure she'll pop back up soon, but... Yeah. Uh, now, the sad news is, is that I remember from what I saw last time I watched this, is that the next episode is easily the weakest episode that I saw. Um, so we do have a maybe a bit of a stinker uh, to get to, to get through before we get back to some good stuff. Yeah, it's the boxing one. <laughs> the boxing one, yes. I don't remember much. I remember the <clears throat> clothing that people wore, the casual wear... Mm-hmm. looked very much like we don't have the budget to make like a lot of clothes so you guys just bring your best like nothing with a logo on it <laughs> bring your best 90s clothes <laughs> yeah um we'll find it what was so weird about it is that Battlestar Galactica you know from 2003 onwards that one uh also had a boxing episode but the boxing episode in that was really good it was like a really mm-hmm. good episode where like the, they basically all worked out their frustrations that they'd all been building up over the season and like a series of like you know you know friendly quote unquote boxing matches that turned kind of serious when they got a bit tense. Um, this is not that. This this is <laughs> from what I remember. This was this was a very mediocre cheesy TV episode where Garibaldi and his friend, uh, one of them's like boxing. I think it's his friend, presumably this boxing, not Garibaldi himself. Garibaldi's the Mickey. He's like punch him, Rocky, or <laughs> something. Um, but no, he's trying to talk him out of it. But uh, we'll find it. We'll find it. We'll rediscover it. Uh, I guess what I'm saying is, is this is one of the longer reviews of these regular length. Obviously, the gallery was longer because it was a longer episode. But uh, I was expect next week's might be the, one of the shortest reviews of any of these because I don't expect. We have a lot be... to say. You never know. We might. I mean, yeah. If this is some really stupid stuff, maybe we'll have a lot to lot to talk about. Uh, actually, one little detail that I noticed here. See when the. Uh, uh, Garrett first arrives with his aunt, mm-hmm. right? So Lord Kiro and her he's got arrive. Great hair. He's got he's got the Londo wall of hair. It's glorious. I noticed that there are two servants, these two younger guys. They have like really small walls of hair, like they're only like an inch yeah. high. And I was like, oh, is that like a rank thing? Do you look, like? I think so, because I think he's supposed to be like he's a lord, right? Yeah, so yeah. his hair is bigger than. <laughs> Because he's, he's not in the episode, but I was starting to think of Veer, and I was like, Wait, "Is Veer?" And I was like, "Yeah, it's shorter than it's bigger than these these grunts, but it's not as big as uh, Londo's." So I, I guess, yeah, it's 
there's a, there is a goof and i looked it up on imdb and it's not listed there but mm. i i noticed it when i watched it is that those two like goons or whatever yeah. they are his guards they get shot and then immediately like it cuts to the guy that shot shot them the the bad guy the bad mm -hmm. raider guy and then back to them and then the guy's alive again <laughs> he's just standing right next to londo I'm like wait he's dead <laughs> i actually did not notice that that's a very good catch yeah it's a very good catch. it's funny it's i it's not even lift, listed on the goose for imdb maybe i should do it i've never done that before you're gonna submit a goof ball. um <laughs> what a weird continuity error uh yeah. Yeah, that's not as bad. I think, uh, was it Space Mutiny? Where a character yeah. who dies literally shows up in a, a scene that's like, cause at least with this, you get that in the editing room, they had to use that shot and it just happened to be after. So it's kind of awkward, but they had to live with it. Yeah, and most people don't notice. Yeah. In Space Mutiny, literally a character has a big tragic death and then two minutes later in another scene, <laughs> she's just sitting at a desk. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly the same woman. <laughs> what? <laughs> Oh jeez, yes, yeah, that's, that's a red brown uh, malarkey. Do, do I you also, I was oh, going. Go I also really love like the meta joke of Garrett Graham asking Willari, "Where did it all go wrong?" Because like, <laughs> <laughs> they're both standing there in these ridiculous wigs, <laughs> both like classically trained actors, going, "Where did I, it all go wrong?" <laughs> this is a really good show though i feel like maybe maybe graham felt that For way as, graham, a, as a guest definitely. star i, I think, like, I think because um, he's never really had his big shot yeah i think peter jurassic who is a regular on the show i feel like at, at least if not yet i feel like he probably had trust in what the show was in the process and that it was mm -hmm. going to be a great thing and seemingly from everything we've heard know is that it's going to be great by the time we're said and done uh but i think yeah guest we'll star see. who has to put on that wig <laughs> It probably feels a little bit silly. Yeah. Yeah. I could see that. I could see that. Um, it's like, I was in Brian De Palma movies. Where did it all go wrong? <laughs> he was in one. There's a little Dr. Lazarus in that. <laughs> he was one Brian De Palma movie. That's not. He was in four of them. Was he? Yeah. What other ones was he in? Greetings, Hi Mom, uh, and Home Movies, plus Phantom of the Paradise. I have never seen any of those except Phantom of the Paradise. These these all must be early ones that are obscure and weird. Uh, they are the yeah. earliest ones. The whole movies is not. It has Nancy Allen in it. That was after Phantom. Okay, all right. Uh, maybe I'll watch that one because Nancy Allen's in it. Yeah. If you I if you can obsess too. over Garrett Graham, I can <laughs> obsess over Young Nancy Allen. Hey, I called her first. <laughs> <laughs> That's not fair. <laughs> Come on now. Um. Okay, I think we're about done. Um, I had another point, and I forgot what it was. Thank you for letting me speak. That's okay. No, you had, you had right away. It's fine. <laughs> um, I realize I can go on a bit. Um, yeah, okay. No, 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 I'll just about do it. So that's science importance. Uh, really great episode, and I, you know, it made me excited for the show going forward. And I knew it would because I, I vaguely remembered it from the first time that I watched these, but. I did, you know, when I got to the end and the main theme kicks in is, like, the head, like, bows as she walks away in Sinclair. It's that high-angle shot looking down as he walks away. That we've, if it, it's what it makes me feel like. It makes me feel like this episode was a crossroads. And this this visual at the end is kind of there to show them walking away down, even though it's just in, like, the cafeteria. It's not like a, the location is not special. But it's made to look like they're walking away down opposite ends of a crossroads. And I think this episode mm. spiritually is a crossroads and... I'm yeah. excited to see where we go. I do so. have one more thing. Oh, go on. That I remembered. I like that we see the urinals. <laughs> 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 we okay. see space urinals and they have, you know, because they have electronics on their hands. They can't mm -hmm. just use water to clean their hands. They have like a, a sonic thing. <laughs> like a sonic hand washing station. I, I appreciate this. Yes. This is, these are all yeah. good details that I, I, I can get on board with. <laughs> I was just excited to see it. We don't get that in Star Trek. I've never seen Star Trek urinals. Yes, Babylon 5, the space, the Hitchcock of space shows. They <laughs> show toilets for the first time ever. That's right. Yes, yeah, for those of you who don't know, Psycho was the first Hollywood movie that featured a toilet in it. Um, I still speculate that there's probably a lot of European movies from before then that probably did it because they're, you know, mainland Europe's a bit of a weird kinky place. They're like, hey, look at this toilet. VV, look at that toilet. You know, I don't know. Uh, definitely German movies. That was maybe French, but the wee wee, but sure. <laughs> well, you know. 
you know the Germans, their reputation with the uh, poop. I thought you were going to say water sports, but sure, poop. <laughs> 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 that's it i don't know how to say shit in german so maybe i should wait with poop so what? I could do it. Scheiße. Scheiße, everybody yeah. knows <laughs> exactly but i don't know how to say piss in german oh i thought you said i don't know how to say no i do know shit in german i do like, know everybody knows yeah Scheiße, yes <laughs> yeah Scheiße. Scheiße. Over. Scheiße for shit visser for wanker okay I, I remember these you could tell my my time in german class was spent <laughs> spent well uh First stick is breakfast, and I can do some numbers. Go. All the basics. All the basics. I can order shit for breakfast. That's the next time I'm in German. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, yes, thank you for joining us. That has been uh, Babylon 5, uh, Sides Important. Uh, we'll be back next week, of course, with the boxing one. We'll see how that goes. <laughs> but, uh, Tara, would you like to promote, uh, what you may call it? I would. So if you enjoy these reviews, <laughs> please check out our Patreon page. It's patreon.com slash TV. And if you donate as low as $1 per month, you will get access to bonus episodes for other shows we do, including The Ace, The Atomic Cinema Experiment, which is our science fiction movie review show. So if you're wondering what this Garrett Graham guy is all about, go check out our, our Patreon page because we have a few of them listed on there now. <laughs> Thanks to me. <laughs> Hey, and if you donate uh, $5 per month, you'll get access to reviews early, including Babylon 5. You'll get a whole week early. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, let's not forget, he's also the villain of Police Academy 6, City Under Siege, which is actually the, the movie that I've known him from since I was a kid. So, just putting I, that out there. I haven't seen that. Surprising. Yes. Right now. Yeah. Yes, it's very... very in, in, in many ways, it's a precursor to Babylon 5. Mm. Uh... <laughs> Well, I'll have to check it out. Like and subscribe, all the usual things that we we say. Like is a, a, a nice, easy, and free way to support everything we do. Uh, catch us on Twitter at mailed underscore fudge for channel updates. Uh, hopefully, you had fun with this discussion. Uh, we will see you next time. Keep watching uh, TV. Keep watching Babylon Five. Just don't give away the home world. <laughs>